young people from all across the country. We had stakeholder conversations, FGDs, um, and through a consultative process, we produced an evidence-based national youth policy, which was approved by the Prime Minister in 2017 as the national youth policy of Bangladesh. The Ministry now is working on the youth action plan and allocating necessary budget to take the uh, policy forward. But I'm happy to chat more about uh, the formulation process, what is in there, some of the priority areas. I see someone from CRI sitting uh, with us. Uh, CRI was also uh, engaged in vetting the document and we worked with them in the later stages. So that is sort of uh, some context about where the policy in Bangladesh right now is. The government is working on the action plan and allocating budget um, to take it forward. May I now uh, invite our distinguished uh, panelists. If you can tell us a bit about That was, uh, that was to wake you up. <laughs> if you can tell us a bit about your work, particularly relating to youth engagement, and, uh, and what, you know, something also reflective at a personal level, what brought you here in this, in this room? So let me uh, start with... Uh, can you hear me? Yeah? My name is Vandana. Um, I uh, am not from Bangladesh. Uh, I live and work in Mumbai. I also don't work on policy, so I'm not exactly sure what I'm doing on this stage. <laughs> but um, I, um, I ran uh, an organization called Akansha. We run a network of schools under a public-private partnership in Mumbai, in Pune, and India. Um, and so we work with 8,000 uh, students in our schools and uh, 2,000 alumni who have graduated from our schools 95% of whom have gone on to college and their higher studies and are working now. Um, so I just wanted to share in that context, I think um, what I'm gonna talk about is what comes before youth inclusion. So when we're thinking about how do young people get involved in policy making, um, it's very easy to say that give them a seat at the table. Um, but what will they do when they're given that seat at the table? And how do we not ensure that that seat at the table doesn't result in just tokenism. That, okay, we included our youth, our job is done, um, you know, and we feel really good about our, we took a picture with a young person and put it in the paper, um, and, and there we go. So how do we actually empower our youth um, to do something when they're given that seat at the table? Um, and I think that is the really hard work of education uh, that we try to do in our schools. Um, that's the hard work that takes time, um, that takes daily efforts of teachers, of youth leaders, um, many of whom are sitting on the stage with me, um, to actually enable students to come to a table to communicate effectively, um, to think critically about problems, um, to offer solutions, to have the energy to drive them on the ground. All of that takes skill. Um, and we don't want to set up our youth uh, for failure when they're given those opportunities to participate and engage. And so when we break out, I'd like to talk a little bit about the process for how we prepare our youth um, to be included, not just the process of how we actually get them to be included in the first place. I'm gonna pass, stop there and pass it on. Yeah. Uh <coughs> Thank you, Vandana. It's really, uh, I'm Moshe, I'm from BRAC, and I, I don't want to talk a lot about what BRAC is doing with you. Uh, there's a uh, magazine out there called Debrief. This year, yeah, this uh, issue is on youth. You'll get a, I would say, a dozen such articles on what BRAC is doing about youth, with youth, for youth, uh, various parts. So uh, I'll just concentrate on. What is our policy interest, if you may, in you? <clears throat> See, uh, there was a time when what tomorrow looks like depended a lot on yesterday. Experience was hugely important, and the important decisions are hence taken by the experienced people. Now you're in, uh, at a time 
when disruption, disruption in technology, disruption in development, disruption in thinking has brought, it, brought us to a level where what is going to happen tomorrow is decided today, if not tomorrow itself. Their innovation, disruptive thinking, new thinking has is not only a nicety, this is a necessity now. And only youth can bring that to the table. A. B. We are passing a time, especially in Bangladesh, where 70% of our population uh, are youth or just crossed youth stage. Third, this is a country where we don't have a lot of mineral resources under our feet. We don't have, we are not endowed with so many other resources that countries have other than this youth population. So if they fail, this nation fail as a nation and not for one day for maybe another hundred years. So all these three tells us that youth now needs to step up to the plate and contribute in the important discussions which were previously probably rightly i don't know reserved for the older more experienced people who has 40 years of experience behind their back to weigh in now tomorrow is the uh, tomorrow of ubers and facebook's of the world which were invented by the youth, run by the youth, shaped by the youth. So, from Brack's policy perspective, we would like to see youth really taking part in those important national development discourse to bring new ideas, new energy, new uh, way of thinking, if you may. And we know that there are many attempts being taken uh, right now, many of which are tokenistic. And of course, capacity is an issue, but there are other issues that some I know. Some being an old person, I can't even imagine. Only many of you were youth here in this audience knows. So that's my interest. Now, if you, one of the question was what brought me here? Uh, when I was a young person, like many of you, I uh, was a part of Bangladesh's National Students' Movement, which has successfully toppled uh, the uh, dictator, uh, a uh, military government who ran the country for nine years. So I know what youth can do if they focus on something. And I'm here with that belief in the youth, because I was part of it. I was the convener of one party, one uh, group of uh, students who was in the forefront in uh, making that change. So my that belief that I formed in 90s kept me going and uh, kept me believing that this youth of Bangladesh if they participate, if they focus, if they put their mind into the Bangladesh of tomorrow, nothing is impossible. Thanks. So I'll probably just stand. Uh, helps. Uh, so when we started IID, we wanted to uh, say that you know we'll make policy public. But when you talk about public, it's the young people. Now, uh, initially, so I will talk about how the, our particular initiative is for policy. So IID started its policy influencing with, with a program we call Policy Breakfast, where like we bring like 25. Uh, top policy makers in a room, Chatham House, you know, rule, you know, uh, no media allowed, so, and 
uh, all the parties can come together. Even like just before this election, three weeks back, we actually brought the top leadership of Aung League BNP uh, on the same uh, road. We used to think that in these programs, if we just actually bring in youth, not as a youth, but as an expert, that's why it ensures a participation. Uh, but a great idea came in one of our first policy breakfasts when uh, the then mayor, so it, it, that happened just one month before the election, mayoral election at the time. So, and we actually connected all of the Amadmi party guys through the sky to how Amadmi party was encouraging the young people. So Anishinaabe told us that why don't you help us getting to you know run a campaign that young people would love. So what we did is that we did a youth manifesto, we surveyed the young people and uh, took the uh, suggestions to all the candidates. Candidates kind of liked it. They say not only that, so media came to us and said, why don't you actually have a proper debate on the manifesto? And it was amazing, like, you know, so we just, young people's voices there, instead of rhetorical debate, they were debating on the questions of the manifesto, if they come to power, what will happen? And we thought, you know, that was it. Then they went, you know, beyond that. So they basically took an oath, all the candidates, both Dhaka North and South, that if we come to power, we will implement this. After that oath, when Anusula came to power a year later, he also actually sat with the other candidates who did not win, to go through those man mandate, uh, you know, the manifesto and see that, okay, so these are the things I'm going to do, these are the things we haven't, you know, produced. So we thought this is amazing. So yeah, people do want to listen to the young people, but there is this gap. And so I say, whenever you go, sometimes I feel that, you know, uh, we are discussing that the young people's inclusion is necessary because why they are left behind. It's the other way around. Because Moshe Bhai what said that you know it's, we are moving to force industrial revolution in many places because young people are not there because old people are doing the policies is basically hindering the development because some of the things moving so fast those people they don't actually know we live in a world where these old people are taking decisions around the world in the Brexit old people basically voted for it young people against it they are the ones taking the consequences so we suggested that you know how we bring she make sure that we also bring these young people into the system as well, not just one of manifesto thing, one of policy thing, because when you say public policy, public policy is not your policy, that book that's lying there. Public policy is a government's decision or a position on behalf of the people. If the government says, I'm not gonna take a policy on that, that is itself a policy. You know, the UK doesn't have a written constitution. So we try something else that in the grassroots level, all the young, volunteer groups that there is, when they are all doing something great, what problem they face in the policy arena and whether they can contribute. That's why we started this policy camp. I will not detail it. You have the uh, a brochure probably on your table. So it's a five-day residential training where we train people on policy entrepreneurship. As in, if you do not have the natural means, that, that needs to be policy advocate, in, advocate in, in a country like traditional country like here, your family connection, your money, or you know, uh, age, all those things, is still how you can do it. And then they go to the field, they collect people, they gather the evidence, they do you know, uh, data analysis, mind mapping, and then they actually present it to the policy maker. They meet face to face with the MPs and others. And beyond that, they also start participating in the policy process. So the policy camp is kind of the way we now envisioning that you know we probably can do something about it. I will stop there. Great, thank you. I think that was very uh, helpful for all of us to get a sense of uh, the work that you're doing. Now, uh, if I may invite uh, all of you to join us in this conversation, uh, the first step perhaps could be uh, filling in the empty seats on the table. So if you could all sort of uh, be, uh, make sure that each of the tables are filled. So the front table, you have a lot of empty seats you can move out or... Uh, and then each one of us will go down and we will uh, split, the, split the groups. So Moshe Bhai, you can look after the middle tables. Pandana, you can go to the left. Said, you can go to the right. 
And the question we have for you is, in your opinion, what do you feel are some of the barriers, some of the obstacles preventing young people from getting their voices heard at the national level? or influencing policy at the national or regional level? What are some of the obstacles facing young people? Is the question clear? Do you need some more clarity on the question? So we spend about 20 minutes and then we will ask one of you from each table to report back. You will stand here and just say what, in your opinion, are some of the barriers. Is that clear? Okay. We will have one person from the
you have identified. Uh, thank you. Uh, my name is Mubur Jodri. I'm the CEO of Humac Lab Limited. It's a uh, software development firm. Uh, so basically, we uh, all discussed and we came across a few uh, barriers for which the uh, the youth actually do not get engaged in uh, the policy making process. So number one is the no formal structure for education. So there's uh, maybe uh, informally or maybe by verbal direction. Uh, uh, the decision makers are asking for more involvement, but there is no practical process or structure or platform. Must be. Then youth are seen as homogeneous, uh, but they are not. So generally, what we see because we already have been discussed this morning, so I am not actually getting into the details. And then you don't know the policies, so illiteracy about the actual policies, just like uh, illiteracy about our own rights. So this the same same sort of like we do not know the policies and that's why you do not know the loopholes and everything. And then going deeper than what is this? tokenism. Uh, this was really about just how do you get meaningful engagement from you rather than just token engagement. And uh, next comes the trust deficit that whether uh, we. It's interesting how I'm saying that we, I'm, even though I'm not actually, uh, by age I'm actually fall, fall into that group. So, but the thing is that uh, there's this clear lack of trust uh, among uh, the youth as well and, and the decision makers that whether actually the decision makers are willing to hear the youth or not. Uh, then comes paternalism, uh, what does it actually enable, enable youth mean? So youth are actually not clear themselves at what enable means. And then um, lack of youth-centric process approach, it was more or less discussed here. Then culture of respect for elders. So this is a very Asian thing, especially a very subcontinent thing that you are junior, so you should keep your mouth shut. And then uh, the, this fear of marginalization, that with, for any different ideas, we, what we very frequently see for any sort of different ideas, the any person, any person is being marginalized by uh, by being labeled as very uh, in 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 uh, very different type of derogatory terms, and then uh, lack of agency ship, which actually shows that there is no clear uh, connection between uh, the youth as well as the uh, policy makers. Okay, great, thank you. I think this is very helpful. A round of applause. The Social Innovation uh, Lab team, they're taking documentation of this and they will sort of sort it out and share, share it with a larger group. Uh, maybe in a couple of weeks, guys? Okay, so we come to this table. Who would like to volunteer? Good afternoon, yeah, sure. Uh, we were running late, so we lost the track of the time, whether it's afternoon or morning. So, um, uh, my name is Afrin, I'm presenting on behalf of this table. Uh, I'm just allowing everyone else as well. If I miss some point, please do add. Um, I was just talking too much and shedding, and they decided to give me. I like, you do it. So, consider the punishment. I'm going to summarize what we have discussed so far. Uh, there are a few points with the previous uh, group who have presumed that the points are similar to us. So uh, I'll just not share about those things, some different points that we have uh, covered. So starting with student politics. Uh, student political uh, involvement in the decisions and their suggestions were lately uh, not as active as it was 20 years back or 30 years back. So lately you know that in Bangladesh we are having uh, after maybe 20 years, Dakshu uh, election. So that's one of the ways that was not uh, having student or youth representations in the policy making. The first thing uh, about that, uh, these are subjective and these are healthy, uh, but they were not there for a long period of time. Second is simplicity. Whenever we hear the word policy and youth policy, 
the words and the thoughts and the ideas are so difficult for you to comprehend what it is all about. So if I don't understand what I'm going to share, so things are not easy. The linguistic barrier is also there for youth policy reformation or participation. Um, there are online presence. Uh, lately we have heard that we don't participate or you don't participate, but there are online presence of people with their comments, share and uh, give their ideas about these things. We have interesting idea about ageism. We did share, the last team did share about ageism. So the age is constructing or at the same time is stopping the youth to give their ideas. So I'm young, that's why I cannot share something, but being 20 year old, I know how does it feel to be a 20 year old. So that reform should be in the policy. Youth policy is very much directed with education, uh, women empowerment, or other things. So my fellow teammate was sharing, he come to know about, the minister was asking, youth minister was asking, do you know about the youth policy? Uh, many people don't know what it is all about, but they know about education policy. And youth policy does not reflect the issues of youth. Being 20 year old, I don't want to go to college. I don't want to do this, I don't want to do this. So this fun part or even the age specific part is stopping them to be part of this policy reformation. That's that's a barrier. Um, and there is an uh, issue of uh, the tension and the issue is also with not taking for granted their ideas because of the age. So the age is in this prevalent area. So that's all about our Actually, Great, thank you all. Oh, and one part, sorry, I forgot. So we don't have the formal policy reformation with youth. As a side track, there's a good part about it, the youth are fixing and making a lot of work for the local perspective. We can go and do the local government specific issues and start working rather than reforming the youth policy. Thank you. Great, thank you. A round of applause. Someone from this table who would like to volunteer? Uh, thank you very much for giving me the opportunity to... Uh, Hello. Oh. Thank you very much. So, Bangladesh Politics. So, I want to say that 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 I want আমার কোনো ভয় ভীতি দেখানো হবে কিনা আমার সামনে কোনো বিপদ হবে কিনা এগুলো একটা বড় কারণ এর পিছনে ফর एग्जांपल কোটা কোটা সংস্কার আন্দোলন যারা এটা করেছিল পলিসি মেকিং এ যারা ডিসিশন দিতে গিয়েছিল আজকে তাদের অনেক সমস্যা হয়েছে তো এই ধরনের एग्जांपल ব্যাড एग्जांपल গুলো আমাদের সামনে যদি আসে দেন ফাদার আমাদের ইয়ার জেনারেশন সেখানে যেতে খুব একটা বেশি উৎসাহী হবে না কারণ আমাদের पॉलिटिकल পার্টি কারণ আমাদের there are decision makers, there are parliament that say, that I want to keep very kid coaches, they too much job on the night, too much voice is not on the night, too much voice takes for all, too much I want to be beautiful for all, how is our punishment of it? So I'm a Kalashi and a job. I'm a case that this security minister that he behaved the way of the city, Mr. Tajama, Amakuru Kutiavana, I'm a family to our jurisdiction coach, I'm a family to our mission coach, I'm a teacher, someone I put you on a party, I'm a punished coach, that I'm a Kalashi and a job. Even a practice time of the family to get sure why you can have a family to buy it to court right even borrow by photo by offices in here you're going to get to the day i'm going to get about to get to borrow by the time right so you're going to come to the chin of the job to share for us tonight i'm going to share a couple of our bad example would have to be the good example the access you know to focus the access and a car is looking here as the product of chance for chance i'm going to see what you can have a chance তাহলে এখানে কোশ্চেন আমরা মিটিং করছি কিন্তু আমরা তো তাদের এই গুড एग्जांपल গুলো নিয়ে আসছি না আমার গুড एग्जांपल কে নিয়ে আসবে আমার যদি সেই एग्जांपल না থাকে তাহলে আমি কিভাবে সামনে দাঁড়াবো আমি কি হবে দেখব যে আমাকে যেতে হবে সেই জায়গায় আমার তো সেই एग्जांपल নাই আমি কিভাবে ইনস্পায়ার হব শুধু কথা যদি ইনস্পায়ার হতো তাহলে তো হতো তাহলে হয়ে যেত শুধু মিষ্টি কথাতে চিরা ভেজা না সো আমাদের কি আরো চিন্তা করতে হবে যে एग्जांपल ক্রিয়েট করতে হবে শুধু কথা দেয়া হবে না নট অনলি পলিসি পলিসি শুধু মাত্র মিটিং নয় এটা কি ইমপ্লিমেন্ট করতে হবে আমার সামনে एग्जांपल সৃষ্টি করতে হবে এরকম হাজার হাজার গ্রুপ হাজার হাজার প্রতি বছর এরকম মিটিং হচ্ছে কিন্তু এর রেজাল্টটা কোথায় আমাদের সেটা দেখতে হবে 
Yeah. So I guess most of the talk. Great. Thank you. A round of applause. Okay. So we are. Uh, we have about a few minutes left for this panel. I uh, want to come back to our to our uh, to our panelists. Can you, uh, in your closing comments, briefly summarize based on what you have heard? What are some of the action steps? What is the way forward? What can we do to uh, make progress on some of the challenges that uh, the speakers have, that the participants have highlighted this afternoon? I'll start with uh, Moshe. So there's a lot of discussion around safe space. So we probably need to go back and think safe space for what and with who. So it's like when you're discussing with your local MP, whatever safe space you want, whether IT can be give, can give you some anonymity, whether that works. Or when you're talking to your local union position, <coughs> remember the, the, there's a challenge of this youth narrative. Whenever we discuss youth, it sounds as if there is one youth we're talking about. There is not a single youth uh, community in Bangladesh. There are youth who are in Dhaka, the youth who are in, you know, in distant parts of Bangladesh. Some are educated, some are not. So we probably also need to then uh, bifurcate this safe space and with whom question and probably uh, try out some of the safe spaces, see what is feasible in short run and try and find it there. Thank you. Uh, we were having a, an interesting discussion, uh, the three of us, uh, just after lunch, talking about, I think, the unique context in this country, in, in Bangladesh, and about, you know, the ceiling of helplessness that I think is sometimes there of, you know, what can we change, um, what can we do about things, how do we make things better, and I think the reason I went into education was because everything that we do with our students, no one can take that away from them. So if you imagine every school in this country, in Bangladesh, if you are, if we are working together to give them the skills, the knowledge, the value systems that they that they need, then you know someone made this point at our table just now. Then there's no um, talk of how do we enable them, how do we include them, because they will include themselves. They will enable themselves. You know, so what does that educational process look like um, in order for that to happen? Because then you don't need to do things for you. Um, they will they will make that change happen on their own. And so that's just something I think, that's why I, I focus on education, on K-12 education, because I believe in that very strongly. But whatever you do, I and mean, there's a reason you're sitting in this room, something has happened in your life that makes you care about uh, inclusion and youth and policy and change more than the average person on the road. What happened in your life to make you care? And how do you create those experiences for others through your work? Um, Great, thank you. Thank you. Uh, okay, so we hear a lot that, you know, uh, these are old people who do not always think that if young people come in, they, they are going to take our space, so they will not, you know, move. Young people think, if the old people don't go, we will not be able to grow, so we need to move, you know, move them out. So it's the kind of old people will say, oh, what do you know? And the young people is going to say, oh, you are so old and obsolete. That is a traditional thing. But we have seen, like, you know, one of the, when we saw that the young people are coming in here, is that the young people chose, you know, uh, the forest approach, that, you know, if in a forest, if the trees are, like, talk together, you always do not need to go into the same space, you find your new areas. So go for innovations that the old people don't understand. Go for new ideas the old people don't understand, and they come to us. Just like the grandmother goes to the child to show them how the Facebook runs. So go for these innovations. So those are the things like, you know, is probably the low-hanging fruit, and the change in the approaches and everything. And the other thing is, uh, last thing is that when you talk about, again, policy, policy is not that book. We don't need to change that book. We don't need to change that government, yeah, everything. You can go uh, some minimum changes as well. If you can convince your local leader to do something, you are actually changing a policy. If you can go to, so that's the more evolution path. Fine. If you want to change the big thing, the revolution one, you will have to get, get into the politics and get your head started. Doesn't. Great. Thank you. Um, 
We also have the additional secretary of the Ministry of Youth and Sports who has just joined us. He will also be speaking and I know uh, Brad will be sharing some of the findings of this session with him. Because at the end of the day, uh, policy is nothing if it cannot influence. I think uh, influence is a core part of any policy. And through these conversations, if we can begin a dialogue on how we can engage with the government, how we can have more youth-friendly policies, we will make progress. Keeping in mind that the change that we seek to have is not going to happen overnight. Change is a slow, gradual process. Sometimes you take one step forward, two step backwards, but what is important is to stay committed, to ask difficult questions, and to keep on talking. I think with all due respect to our fiery speaker who said, what's the point of talking? I think talking is a great way, dialogue is a great way of making progress. Just getting on the street is not the solution. We have to keep on engaged, listen to differing ideas, and figure out collectively as the people of you know of Bangladesh of this world how do we move forward? With that, thank you very much for participating in this conversation. Uh, a very good uh, evening to you all. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ajaj Bhai, Please please join us a big round of applause for our incredible panelists for this workshop. So unfortunately, we are a little capped on time, so it would be great if you guys just go outside, get your coffee and your snack, and come back here. All our panelists and our guests for the final session are here, so we will start sharp at 4. Please bring your coffee and snack from outside back here. Thank you so much. Thank you. 4,200 uh, youth, of which 50% are male and 50% are female. The coverage was, uh, it was 18 to 35 years of age in 150 upazilas and 51 zilas. The results are significant at division level. So this was a randomized uh, survey that we have done. Uh, the results, the, the focus of the survey is to really identify what is the identity of our current, uh, our, our youth population, what they aspire, what they want to do if they are not happy about it, what in their current situation. So we actually ask them, what do you think and you are going to do instead of what do you want government to do or what do you want others to do, if you may. Uh, so one interesting thing, uh, a majority of uh, Bangladeshi youth would like to identify themselves with their nationality. They are Bangladeshi first. 45% uh, of female and 49% of male preferred uh, being identified as Bangladeshi or Bangali. Only 23% of female and 17% preferred religion as an identity. And uh, there are other minority who has other uh, kind of uh, way of identifying themselves, if you may. And the, the graph on the left uh, is actually bit, uh, the difference between rural and urban, if you may. The urban is the red one. As you can see, the, uh, in, in case of urban, the level of education, if you may, uh, has a significant impact, as it seems, on their identity as uh, as uh, national, uh, nationally identified, and, and rural is the uh, blue line uh, in, in this graph. The next uh, slide is about life goals, if you may. This is there's a huge gender. Uh, gender diversity, if you may, uh, different results. When you ask, what do you want to do in 20 years from now? Uh, the reality is a large portion of women told us that they want to uh, engage in bringing uh, bright children, uh, a, lar a large, large segment. And for men, they talked about they would like to have uh, government service, they would like to accumulate wealth, becoming wealthy. Remember, when we asked this question, this is the cross-section of people. They were people from rural Bangladesh, urban, peri-urban areas, if you may. 
so that that's one. Uh, and interesting thing is when we ask uh, the, the life goal in uh, the correlation with socioeconomic status, we have seen that the life goals of uh, bringing up a children is negatively related with education. The more they educated the girls are, they would like to do prefer something else than just bringing up the children. But then there are some goals where the relationship is negative. For example, asset accumulation. Interesting, not so interesting finding. If you are poor or rich, you are more inclined to asset accumulation as a goal. If you are middle class, you are more interested in getting a job, if you may. Uh, next result, one of the most worrisome results that we have found, that only 39% of male and 29% of female say they believe their education is leading them to a job. Rest of them feel that education is not really useful to the to their future goal, if you may. Those who say, yes, education is important, among them, of course, as you can see, uh, those who have passed HSC, the higher secondary, they are more hopeful. 85% of male and 82% of female thought that their education is going to contribute. But remember, this is of that sliver who said it is relevant. Most of them said their education is not relevant to their aspiration, if you may. Employment, again, similar results. There's the U-shaped relation between education and income. These are people who are currently employed as a young person. This is not our future employment, what they're doing right now. Those who doesn't have education or have lower level of education are already engaged in income generating activities. And those who are from the higher income strata, they are also involved in, in income generating activities. Remember this uh, bracket is 18 to 35. Even in a tender age, if you are from a wealthy family, most likely you are already earning income. So, but if you are not, if you are, if you are from the poorer family, then maybe you are not going to school, but you are involved in income generating activities. Only if you're in the middle, then uh, you're not earning that much. And then again, there's a huge in, uh, disparity, gender disparity. Uh, and if we look at male versus female, 91% of the males who say who are earning income, 91% of them are male and rest are female. So the female, uh, those who say who are already earning, among them, the rate of the male versus female is a big disparity. So even if uh, your colleague uh, coming from the same income strata is earning as a male, if you are a female, most likely you are not engaged in any income generating activities. Vocational training, again one uh, telling result that 85% of the youth think vocational training is important. It's important for them getting a job, but only 14% receive them or intend to receive them. So while everybody is thinking this is important, there is this uh, fallacy, if you may, they have not taken any step or not, not do the intent to take any step to get vocational education. So maybe we need to look into the stigma, taboo uh, associated with vocational education or maybe access barriers, which is stopping them from uh, taking education. Next result is again, not unsurprising to many of us, 82% of youth believe they should participate in national planning. 42% of the youth think they should participate in politics, but only 3% of them do. So again, there is this uh, gap of what is expected and what they are doing. Uh, this is something that I'm sure uh, uh, there are political things that you can look at, deep look into this, that why so many people think this is important, but they are not participating, or what can be de uh, done to bring them uh, here. My last slide, oh, uh, last
ask for but one slide is this uh, what is when we ask what is your major concern and we also ask what do you want to do about it two interesting things uh, here uh, around four percent says uh, I don't have any concern or I don't know if you may but the majority and these are multiple choice questions so majority said corruption is their biggest concern 85 86 percent of them said corruption is the, the biggest concern but if you take out corruption uh, there are weak infrastructure uh, 20 percent said weak infrastructure economic inequality 21 percent moral decay 22 percent lack of security 20 percent so these are also, if you take out this uh, outlier uh, corruption, these are also significant uh, uh, concern came from the youth. But then when we ask you which cause of these are you most passionate about, you want to do something about it, again, majority said they would like to do something about corruption. Uh, so if we want to involve them, they would like to get involved in eliminating corruption. But then they also talked about they, they, they would like to do something about Food safety they, uh, and uh, uh, and 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 uh, in take part in countries development. So this is the result uh, from them. Then we ask, okay, this is what you want to do. What you are doing now? Are you doing? Are you planning to do something about it? 60% of the youth say they feel powerless. They cannot do anything, even if they want to engage in corruption, even if they feel corruption is a big problem, but they don't think they have any chance, any option, any avenue to get engaged. Others, uh, the other 40%, mostly talked about that they are, a, uh, some are involved in improving educational sector, some are doing free school, free training, uh, helping others to uh, learn. So they are already engaged in helping others to improve their educational level. Some saying they are uh, planning to start a startup to create more employment. Some of them are this uh, part of this movement called Chakri, Devo, uh, Chakri China Chakri Devo. So they are saying they are already part of that. Their goal is to create more employment and, uh, and so on. And others are saying they are fighting obstacles of development. They're saying solving various social problems. They're creating awareness. Some are working for different NGOs and working on awareness building, social mobilization, and so on and so forth. So these are the three most popular sectors. They're either working in education, free class, uh, you know, few tuition, and so on. They are talking improving employment by creating employment, and they are uh, working with different NGOs and social organizations to help the country develop. So these are the few uh, eight insights, if you may, coming out of this survey. The actual survey will be, uh, the result will be around 150 pages long and they will more detail and nuances uh, we hope to present soon once it is done. The, but we wanted to present the summary here because we cannot you know, uh, have the entire Bangladesh in this room and we could not reach out to every strata of youth uh, and put them into this room, but this is a representative survey, if you may. So this voice may also give some food for thought uh, in the next plenary uh, panel for discussion. Thank you.